All right, welcome to another episode of Micro Shiners Life Distilled. I'm Brian Carey. I'm here at Independent Distilling in Atlanta, Georgia. I am here with Casey and Michael, who are. Uh, explain yourselves, gentlemen. Are you guys uh, co owners? Let's get into that. So, Michael, introduce yourself, please. So, I'm actually the owner, distiller, a little bit of everything. Uh, we're a small shop basically me and uh, Casey here works with me as well as a couple other uh, small brands. He's got a company called Liquid Culture uh, that uh, works with small guys uh, like ourselves who can't bring somebody on full time. Um, he knows the market really well and uh, he does cocktails, he does a little bit of everything. Um, and he can probably tell you more about that, but as far as what I do, I pretty much do it all. I mean, we're, we're tiny, you know. Okay. Uh, we met my old man who does tours for us on Saturdays, um, but other than that, and then we've got one other person that uh, does cocktails and works the bar um, when we're open to the public. But okay, much no, that's okay. So we're go. we're micro. Okay, all right, no, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Casey. So yeah, explain your roles a little bit. What you do? So I, I help out uh, Michael here. Um, I like I said, I have a small company that does uh, brand advocacy for craft distilleries here in Georgia. Uh, we have six clients that we work with. Uh, some, depending on the level of involvement, is depends on the, the, the brand that we're working with. Uh, with independent, I'm more heavily involved uh, here for sure. Uh, we don't do some of the distilling uh, with Michael, and you know, kind of came. I met Michael uh, six years uh, six years ago. Six or seven. Six six seven eight years ago, when he was starting up this company, and I came to him, and he was like, "I'm going to open a distillery," and I was like, "That's awesome." Uh, so and he was like, we're gonna open up a Decatur, and I was like, well, let me know. And we just kind of, kind of kept in contact, and he let me know when he was opening up. It came around, uh, and I just started hanging out uh, at the distillery all the time. And I said, hey, you need somebody to go around and talk about your stuff uh, to people. And uh, he's like, that's a great idea. So slowly became more and more involved here. You know, I do, like I said, everything from distilling, working right. in the tasting room, bottling, right. uh, label design, you know, we all do together. Uh, events. Yeah, events. Yeah. Yeah. Very and we, cool. We, we do everything, uh, you know, very, very involved here, but it's a, it's a, it's a okay. great, great process. So, I mean, so you kind of explained what you do, but how, how did the idea for independent distilling come about, Michael? I guess this is your, this is your child, essentially, right? Yeah. Uh, I was a whiskey guy, I love whiskey, and I never like grew up wanting to be a distiller or run a distillery. Um, I started reading about these little tiny distilleries, mostly out on the west coast at the time. You were starting to see them in places like, you know, of course like Seattle, Portland, and then Denver, and New York, and right. you started seeing these areas where it's really starting to take off. And I just got kind of obsessed with the idea a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Um, a little carried away and decided I wanted to do it. Um, I mean, I love the whole idea of of taking like real basic raw ingredients. Like, I mean, bourbon, you know, you're taking corn, one of the most right. basic grains out there and, um, you know, turning it into this this magnificent drink. And that, that was just really cool to me. It's such an organic process. And just, uh, again, I just, I, I've always liked to make stuff and do stuff hands on. And so just maybe I got a little carried away, but right. here we are, for better right. or for worse. We, Awesome. We've doing made it, it this far. You're doing it. Excellent. <laughs> so, I mean, how long, how many years have you guys been up? In uh, we celebrated four years of being in production uh, last month. Very cool. Um, so, uh, it took a couple of years before that of just, uh, but for me, just learning both the business side and the production side. But um, also, like, you know, here, you know, we're, we're in the Bible Belt here and we just, in our case, uh, there with, with City of Decatur, which is where we are, um, they didn't have any laws. Um, they were they they were great to work with, but right. there was no zoning that allowed for us to do this. They, they had to change that. There was no uh, license for me to go apply for, so they had to change the yeah. city ordinance so that there was a license um, that I could even apply for. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's. The, the distilling, the craft distilling industry is changing so fast. It's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's a lot of fun to see where it's going to wind up going. But uh, you mentioned pouring some whiskey. You want to you want to taste something first? You want to yeah. go into it? <laughs> and then plus, like yeah, it's just sold. Have, have do you want to try the rum, or what do you what do you, you want to start there? 
Um, what do you guys think? Let's start a little bit of the age drop. Age okay. I'm, 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 I'm big on this age drop. This, okay. We, we just blended this batch. So for the, the age drum, we're actually blending from several barrels. Uh, we age in ex-bourbon, like uh, most dramas, but we also age some in new oak. Okay. Uh, because we like some of that new oak, but we also like the, the ex-bourbon uh, as well. So hopefully if we get it right, we, we kind of get the best of both worlds. Right. Um, so this is sugarcane sourced? From. Yeah, so we're uh, we're using a table grade molasses. You know, okay. most rum's made from blackstrap, okay. um, which is the byproduct of sugar making. We're using right. a table grade, so we're starting out with a real premium um, molasses, which gives us a really nice ferment going into the still. And so we just do a double distillation on it. So really light distillation, just like we do with our whiskeys. It's just a one-two pot still distillation. Uh, so we're able to leave all that flavor in there that we love, and not have to strip it out. Yeah. No, I, I, I smell molasses. That's nice. Well, and that's smells, that's by design. We yeah. want you to be able to smell and taste that base in there. You know, right. the focus here is really high quality ingredients, and that light that light distillation really leaves that flavor in there. Mm -hmm. This is a blend of several barrels that we're using from a 53 to a 10, 15 gallon barrels that are all used. Uh, they held our bourbon in it to uh, the like Michael said, the brand new barrels. Wow. Uh, as well so it's uh this is kind of a fun project we were doing this the the whiskeys are kind of more single barrel to you know very right. really small blends uh, but this is a little bit more complex it's kind of a fun uh project to put together and each one is has its own unique, unique flavor profile uh, yep. they're all very close but there's all little nuances in between that makes them makes them pretty cool and but, you can tell it finishes a lot drier most roms uh the the big the big day roms uh which is one of the reasons i never liked rom until when I got into this whole having yeah. a distillery thing, I actually got introduced to rum. I had no plans of producing rum. Right. I actually got introduced to good rum. Somebody gave me rum. I was like, I had no right. idea rum could be this good. Uh, a lot of them are adding caramel back for color and sweetness. Okay. So you get that really kind of cloying kind of sweetness, yeah. which I, I don't care for. Right. So you'll, you'll notice on this, uh, we're not adding anything back to it. All the color, all the character you get from both the, the base material and then the, um, those barrels. And so you get a nice dry finish. Yeah. Um, it's actually closer to a whiskey type finish than what you okay. expect from a lot of rums. Yeah. But then again, I'm a whiskey guy first, so mm. that's kind of where we're <laughs> well, that, that, up on that. No, that is great. That is that is fantastic. Fairly. So, how long do you age it for? Then I guess. It all depends. It all depends. Yeah. yeah okay. I mean, it's all over the map. It's uh, with those newer barrels, uh, a year maybe. Oh, okay. Uh, it oh, picks up that wood really, really fast. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing how fast in a new barrel, uh, whatever spirit you put in there, picks up that wood. Um, with the uh, 53X bourbons, it's we're bottling stuff that's three years right now. Okay. Um, so and, and then kind of everything in between. Most of the 15-gallon uh, barrels that we're using are about 18 months. Uh, again, it, it just depends on... That's we've got all these barrels we can choose from, and so what we're doing is just pulling based on cool. okay you know we're thinking okay with this one we were really missing the sweetness right so we went back to one of those 15 gallon barrels that we felt had that nice sweet Got note, it. and we that's how we were able to get some sweetness because prior to that it was it was like super dry it was, right. it was yeah. drier than we wanted very very oaky too <laughs> yeah like the oak yeah. was just a little too intense yeah no i and then we added that in and it was like wow that's perfect just yeah. needed to round it out a little bit exactly no that's one thing i noticed with like uh like when people do the the, sh the small aging, like you yep. said, yeah, five yeah. gallons, fifteen gallon yeah. barrels, something like that, and it just becomes too intense. And yeah, they, it gets very tannic. Or they, or they, yeah. they yeah. feel they feel obligated to bottle it too early. Like, okay, we aged it four months. That's long enough. And yeah, the flavor's there, but it's like they they push it, and it's like it's really uh, it's too intense. But this is great. This is great, Ron. Thank you. I love Thank this. You. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, we really enjoyed, uh, we've been moving up to 30 gallon barrels for Got a lot it. of our aging and yeah. the flavor profiles we're pulling out of those right. are really fantastic. A lot more for all the whiskeys and the rums, we're getting, you get more fruit. Uh, it's a little bit more delicate oak or like vanilla flavors as opposed to that heavy tannic uh, that you get from like the 15s and 10s Got it. and the smaller okay. ones that we really enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. this one what we've seen. So. Cool. We've been moving to 30s and we've also been going in at a lower proof. Starting out uh, with all the bourbon in particular, we were going in at 125, which is kind mm -hmm. of standard. And now we're going in closer to 115. And we found out just by playing around trial error, we really like, we, we get pretty notably different flavors just by going in at that lower proof. Um, 
as that spirit's aging and, and so far we're really liking that so we're going all 30s and all roughly 115 ish uh, cool. proof right now uh, i think the the 30s are kind of a nice balance between the 53s and the 15s the 15s we liked what was coming out of them but right. clearly the stuff and we're probably our oldest stuff in 30s now is about 18 months to two years i guess actually we got yeah about yeah. that okay. and, and i mean already we're we're much much happier with with what we're with what we're putting out very cool um so what's the proof on this guy oh 85 85 yeah oh, that's that's nice that's very cool excellent yeah. so i mean okay so you do make rum and uh, i guess what inspired your rum creation i mean yeah I, you're a whiskey guy so i mean i get that that's the, that's the one thing i do understand about you know distilling it's like whiskey takes time but when you open a distillery, you have to turn some kind of profit. So that's where the gin or the vodka comes into play. Right. Because you can create that much faster and start, you know, uh, generating some revenue. So you can keep funding your whiskey projects. Um, but, uh, I mean, I guess, why rum again? Like, why, why did you just Actually, kinda... um, when I was just getting into all this, uh, before I even, like, got really formally into it... Um, there's a guy down in southwest Georgia, uh, in Richland, Georgia, and he makes rum, and he grows all his own sugar cane, and he pot distills it on little copper pot stills like we're using. And I went down there to see him, not because I cared about rum, but because right. I wanted to see a setup and just talk to him. Uh, and he's a super guy, a really, really unique, interesting guy. And uh, I tried his rum, and that, that, was, that was it when I was like, this, and it, coming right off the still even, I was right. like, this is, this is, freaking good man that's and that's when it kind of clicked for me uh you know and i started kind of looking into rum and uh realizing that you know there's not all rums created equal not that you needed to know that but i mean you all assume that but i just never really paid any attention to rum until yeah i had it and was saw that you know being produced in a certain way you can create this really nice rum um that was something you know that was right in line with what I wanted to do, where I could take something uh, that's, you know, a widely recognized spirit, but but do something different with it, right. you know, and not night and day different, but, you know, pretty, pretty unique. Definitely. Um, there aren't many people out there other than other small guys like us that are using high grade molasses just because yeah. on a large, large scale, it just doesn't make no, sense. No, that's, no, uh, exactly. But, but for us and what we're trying to do, it makes total sense. Definitely. And I'm sorry, um, you probably already answered this. Where do you get your molasses from? Where do you source that from again? Yeah, it just comes from uh, Domino's. It's, uh, I mean, okay. it's, it's oh, okay. bulk molasses. Okay. Uh, we'd love to do uh, local stuff, um, but that's as close no, as we can no, get. I Domestically mean, produced. No, is about no, I get it. You get it. I mean, you got to start somewhere. Um, but yeah. we have, uh, we've talked uh, to some folks that are growing sugar cane. I'd love to do an agricole. Um, okay. Just as kind of a one-off. Yeah. Um, and we actually, there's some folks growing uh, sugar cane down on Sea Island off the Georgia coast. Yeah. And they had talked to us about it. Unfortunately, they got uh, hit by Irma pretty hard, right. Hurricane Irma, and lost a good bit of their crop. But uh, we'll hopefully we'll yeah. catch back up with them this year. Yeah, that's, and, that's, and that's why it's required. Get some acquired. fresh cane juice and, yeah. and yep. ferment that and distill that. No, I mean, because that's, and I, uh, just kind of going off sub subject a little bit, I, uh, um, buddy of mine is working for Maui Brewing Company and uh, the secret's out I guess they're starting a distillery um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they had some issues with their sugar cane so they were going to do a rum but I think something happened uh, with the I don't know I might get in trouble for talking about this but uh, <laughs> because of uh, the volcano going off and stuff I think they lost some of their crop from their sugar cane so now right. they're kind of changing their program and I yeah. think they might be going more gin focused um, to start, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, so that's, that's what I was kind of wondering where, where you were, I mean, I mean, you, you gotta start somewhere, you know, obviously, you know, and that's, but, yeah. and that's what you're doing with that product is producing that aged rum. It's fantastic. Right. So keep doing right. it. Yeah. Right. Right. Don't. It. So, um, but cool. So we're, I guess, I mean, let's try something else if we can. What do you want to get yeah. into? I, I, you guys, you guys tell me. We can do the bourbon uh, if you want to keep on it. I mean, the bourbon's unique in its own way. Okay. Uh, but we've also got uh, that little bottle down there is a rye whiskey we did. Oh wow! Um, and this is where we took, and it's it's pretty unique. Uh, it's two thirds rye, Georgia grown rye, and then okay. one third malted wheat. 
Okay. Um, so it's a pretty distinctive mash bill there. Okay. And uh, we created one barrel of that, and that was it. It was just a, it's really hard to find Georgia grown rye. Okay. Um, so we did what what we could with what we had. So cool. Um, so that, that it, product's from Georgia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it turned yeah, out yeah, really yeah. nicely. Really cool. nicely. Yeah. Wheat and corn we can get really easily. Yeah. Rye's hard to come by. We we did a hundred percent rye. Um, excuse me, wheat whiskey. Yeah. Um, as one of our special releases, it, and it's just part of playing around and see what works and what doesn't. And yeah. We're just now getting to the point after having produced for four years that we feel like this is what works, this is done. Right. Okay, so let's start actually producing it now. Cool. Um, whereas before it was, let's make a barrel of it and make sure it's actually good. Right, okay. Um, and, and the people like it. It doesn't just need to be good. People have to actually want to buy it or it doesn't well, make sense. I, uh, yeah, I really want to try that. So maybe let's save that one for last. Go to that one okay. um, let's, try, uh, let's try the bourbon. Okay. Try the bourbon? Yeah, sure. So, so the bourbon, we're even using uh, Georgia corn. 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 Yeah, so yeah. it's 83% corn cool. from Riverview Farms at our range of Georgia. Uh, it's locally sourced. And then 17% uh, malted barley. Okay. So the barley doesn't come from Georgia, so we don't grow barley yeah. in Georgia. So No, definitely. Nobody yeah. malts in Georgia. Nobody yeah. malts in Georgia. Definitely. So the distinctive thing here, as you can see, we do a corn whiskey as well. Uh, and same spirit. Right. The corn whiskey and the bourbon are the same. Just you know, unaged versus that right. new charred oak. Um, what's distinctive about this is there's no third grain. So essentially what I was looking to do yeah. was just really focus on that corn. It, it's kind of a throwback type of bourbon. I mean, back in the old days, you know, it, people would just use whatever grains they had, you know, and that's how you wound up with some rye right. there or some wheat sometimes right. or whatever, oats, you know, you never knew yeah. back in the old days, you used what you had. And so, this would have been a pretty traditional recipe um, for a corn whiskey. Uh, and then you put that corn whiskey in that new oak and that's where you get bourbon. So right. it doesn't have any rye in it, no wheat. So there's no third flavoring grain. That's, um, that's cool. And that's rare. It's rare to yeah, see. Yeah. That's, it, smells, it smells great. It smells like a fresh husk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like... And it's young. I think I mean, uh, just, this one's 17 sure. months. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we hope to, of course, keep you know, as we go, be bottling stuff that's older and older, but we're certainly happy with what we've got now. So it has a really round flavor profile right. you know, from all the heavy corn. So we don't get that, you know, with rye, you're gonna get that spicy note, you know, the more herbaceous note, but with this, it just kind of creates a really nice round flavor profile. No, definitely. It comes in, it comes in like a little hot. I mean, I yeah, get that. It's 92 proof. 92 yeah, the 92 proof, proof yeah. definitely. Yes. So, but that's why I'm like, I got it. Okay. Yeah. But it, it, it's, uh, it's fleeting. It leaves, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's gone now. Like it's, yeah. it's there, the heat's there, but then it takes off. And there's a little bit um, of water behind you if you'd like some water. Oh, and I got a cup. Thank you. Okay. I, yeah, I got a glass. Um, okay. Now I got to ask, uh, the label, the, is that a new? Salamander? That is a salamander. Okay. So hellbenders are the largest salamander in North America. Very cool. Uh, the reason we went with hellbender, aside from the fact that it's just a cool ass name for whiskey. Yeah, definitely. Can I curse on the podcast? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, they're found uh, throughout the Appalachians, uh, all the way from Georgia up to uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, so uh, they're wide, well, at one point would have been widespread. They're in decline. Uh, one of the reasons is because of water. So right. the, the tie here between corn whiskey and bourbon and a big salamander is back in the old days, you had to go to where people always ask about water when they come through on right. tours. And I'm like, back in the old days, they're like, is water important? I'm like, absolutely. Right. You know, now we can filter water. We can run reverse osmosis. We yeah. can add stuff back. We can take stuff out. Back in the old days, you know, you had to go to where good water was. Mm -hmm. And so if you're up in the mountains looking for uh, a nice stream to make some whiskey with. You need cold, clean, and fast-moving water, and uh, that's exactly what these hellbenders need as well. Um, which is one of the reasons they're in decline is because uh, is some of these streams are polluted; they get silt, um, and so uh, those streams are harder and harder to come by. But um, that was the tie there. Their, okay. Their other nickname is Snot Otter. Snot Otter, uh, which I which thought was a great name. Yeah, man. Casey <laughs> loved. It didn't test well in our focus right. groups. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so well, it didn't test well with Michael. We really would help it. Yeah. We're gonna do. We're gonna do like a side project called Snot Otter. Yeah. Snot Otter. Because then you can go. You know, I got Snot Ottered last night. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, 
Oh, I like so that. <laughs> there we go. Okay. He's, he's got this all thought out. I've got a whole, I've got it all, yeah. I got the labels, I got everything. It's yep. going to be fantastic. And more jokes. <laughs> Oh man, well that's that's great yeah. stuff too. You know, it, it's it's all about not you know coming into this. I didn't want to. I was almost hesitant to even do a bourbon, um, even though that's what kind of got me started in whiskey in the first place. Right. And I still love bourbon, uh, just because there are all these expectations with bourbon, um, and you know, so I wanted to bring something new to the table, not something wildly different, right. but something you know. It, it's not like, you know, all that bourbon coming out of Kentucky is bad. Right. They're putting out some really, really good bourbon. So right. why do I want to try to reproduce that Absolutely. when they're going to do it better than me, cheaper than me, faster than me? I mean, they're going to beat me in every way there. Um, you know, best case scenario, I could maybe replicate something that they're doing already. And that's just pointless. I mean, to me, small distillers need to bring something new to the conversation. If not, you know, just go out and source something, you know, why even bother making it? Um, when somebody can make it for you if you're just not going to do something. Um, so that, that was our way of bringing something again, kind of like an old throwback style of bourbon that, you know, you might have gotten, you know, before bourbon was a big commercialized thing. Uh, and so that was kind of the, the thinking there to, to just to bring something new to the conversation and, and let people try something a little different. And also to really focus on that, that corn and representing kind of that, that homegrown aspect of it. You know, that's what, you know, corn georgia corn tastes like when you turn it into bourbon right no that's 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 awesome that's that's the idea um have you ever thought about doing uh, uh like a, a bottled and bond project or something we've like actually that? works we've yeah. actually got some stuff that's uh just past four years uh last month since that's okay. when we celebrated our four years so Very yeah cool. Excellent. We're, we're considering doing some, some bottled and bond. Yeah, stuff. I mean. It, it'd be some really, you know, it'd be a little small release just because we don't have yeah. a whole lot of four-year-old volume. If we did, I'd be in good shape, but. Yeah, no, definitely. Don't, so. No, I mean, I just, to me, that's like, uh, that's the way everything should be, I mean, in theory, everything should be like bottled and bond, you know, quote unquote, you know, all local, you know, source, local stuff like that. And that's, uh, that's cool. Um, well, excellent. Well, the, the bourbon is great. It is. Uh, it is. It's. It's a little hot, but you like. Like you say, you see. You see the simplicity of the two ingredients, and like yeah. that's what. That's what I like about that. That's. That's great. So okay. So, but what? Now you say you don't want to do whiskey. You're kind of thinking about it. What did you set out to do? I mean, what to to I create? You set I, out to create whiskey. whiskey? I, I'll, I'll, oh, I mean, I'm okay. a whiskey guy through and through. Just with bourbon. Because oh, again, bourbon. Everybody coming in there, and you know, there's just. There's this expectation with bourbon, and, mm -hmm. and again, going back to you know the the mass producers, again, there's not a quality issue there. Right. There's just, but even though there are you know there are a lot of different styles of bourbon, they're all pretty similar. Unless you're right. one of these people like us who spends a lot of time tasting them and trying them side by side and, and things like that. For the average consumer, kind of bourbon's all kind of bourbon, you right. know. Um, and if you try to do something too far out of the box, you know, you'll, you'll hear about it. And yeah. again, that's, you know, I'm not looking to like push the limits of what bourbon is. That's, right. that's not really, but you know, as, as you can see with like something like the rye whiskey we did, I'm certainly looking to not necessarily push the limits, but just, you know, create things that, uh, big producers either don't want to, or aren't willing to, or, right. and, and you know, again, that, that's where small distillers exactly. have value is in exactly. bringing something new to the table. I mean, you know, the, like we did that wheat whiskey and, and again, mm -hmm. we're really happy with it. So we're going to start producing it. Right. But, uh, right now, I mean, uh, you know, there's only one like readily available mass produced, uh, wheat whiskey. And, um, I mean, to me, it's closer to a bourbon because it's got such a high got corn it. content. I mean, with this one, we did the hundred percent wheat. I mean, nobody, even right. a non-bourbon drinker, would have mistaken it for bourbon. I mean, it, it. it tasted completely unique, even though we're aging in, in New Oak. Um, it was just, you know, mm -hmm. a whole other style of whiskey in, it, in itself. And I think that's, that's what we ought to be doing. And that's what I enjoy anyway. I mean, right. again, I don't, you know, it's like uh, if you were home brewing and you wanted to try to make Bud right. Light. I mean, it's kind of... <laughs> lesson in futility i mean you know why i mean you know if i'm gonna go through yeah. the pain and suffering of doing this uh you know you you want to come out with something that that's really unique and good and that you can be proud of and 
you know, that's the fun of this tasting room is yeah. people coming through here and getting to try this stuff that they wouldn't have otherwise, whether they're whiskey yeah. drinkers or not. Um, and we get people coming in and they're like, you know, I didn't, the, the weed in particular, uh, people who were not whiskey drinkers are like, wow, I, I drink that. Right. Um, again, it's, that, that's what the little guys need to be doing. It's, yeah. It's stepping, yeah. New. yeah, stepping outside the box. Cool. Um, and I'm well, going to go check on this. Yeah, yeah, go, go check on this still if you got to. Cool. Um, so I guess, so for those who are listening, Michael has to go check on the still because we are currently in production right now at uh, the location. Uh, but Casey, talk about your background. Did you, if I recall, do you have some bartending experience or background? Or? Yeah, so I came from, uh, from restaurants uh, and that's how I met Michael. I used to, I ran a whiskey bar uh, in Decatur. It was kind of the first, um, you know, very serious whiskey bar. It was called uh, Mac McGee. And we had 600 whiskeys behind the bar. So it was one of the largest collections here in Atlanta and the Southeast at the time. And I did an event for local distillers. Michael showed up uh, at the event and um, we had all the local guys at that time. There were like five local distillers at, the, at that point. Right. So it was still a really, really small community. Um, and uh, so I, that's, that's where I met Michael. Uh, so I, I was, when I was there, I was the whiskey specialist uh, for the restaurant. So I ran that restaurant, uh, and then I left there and went to uh, Holman and Finch, uh, this resurgence group, and I was the whiskey specialist for them and created a whiskey society, did whiskey events. Uh, so that's really my background, where I came from. Uh, I was also, like Michael, I was a home brewer uh, as well. Um, so that's where I kind of, I mean, that's where I developed my love of whiskey. Um, and that's kind of how I wound up, you know, working with Michael, just kind of meeting him. Um, and I worked with a lot of the other local distillers. I kind of went to them and said, hey, look, you guys need somebody to go walk around and talk about your stuff because right. th- nobody was doing that. Yeah. You know, they were busy, you know, making product, and you know, it was it was a you know all, everybody was small mom and pop, maybe two people that you know worked at the distillery and you know they did yeah. everything you know or they weren't you know local in the Atlanta market. They were you know in South Georgia or North Georgia or something like that. So th- I brought those kind of guys together and said, hey, look, let's let's combine our efforts and I'll bring everybody's stuff around. We'll present this as Georgia distilleries in Georgia cool so that's that's kind of where uh, that's how I created my company okay and what what I do cool so you we kind of we we talked about at the beginning but uh so your company helps source people to promote distilleries yeah so brand advocacy okay is what we do so we'll, what we do is we'll have uh, we have a we have a team now it used to be it used to be a really small just be me and my business partner uh, and we would go out and talk to package stores and uh, restaurants and, you know, and talk about, hey, look, this, this is this new product and, you know, try to do ride with, work with the distributors and sell product into the, uh, into the restaurants and also do present like cocktails and get on cocktail menus. Right. You know, that's really the key for these small brands is, you know, you get put on a back bar. It's great. You get that placement. But if you just sit on that back bar, it doesn't do anybody any exactly. good. So if you're on a cocktail menu place, you get a cocktail menu placement and you have your name on the cocktail list. Yep. Not everybody's going to read it, but they will read, some people will read it and go, oh, look, independent distilling. Uh, it's on, you know, this is in yeah. their daiquiri that's on their, their cocktail menu. Well, yeah. where is that? And then you get, you know, you do staff education and come in and, you know, make sure the staff knows about it. So when they say, oh, what's, what's independent distilling? Or they say, oh, hey, did you know that's made here locally in, in Georgia? Um, yeah. And that's really kind of what we, what we were focused on you know, initially. Uh, now we work with na- national and international brands. Uh, we've kind of grown our company uh, quite a bit. Um, but still my heart is here with, with the local guys because, you know, I saw this, I grew up in kind of in the middle of the craft beer movement. Um, right. I was a home brewer then and, you know, saw this expansion, you know, rapid expansion of, of breweries around the country. Right. And then, you know, being more focused on spirits as I got, you know, when I was running Matt McGee, then I saw this kind of this popping up, like these small craft distilleries popping up, uh, you know, around the state. And I was like, this is the next thing. Like, we're, I'm right here in the middle of this, and it's you got to be able to recognize when those things are going on. And I, I realized that that's this is the next thing that's going that's going to happen. I want to be a part of this in some way. So that's where you know working with Michael and some of the other guys, you know, and learning, you know, the business. And I mean, because I knew restaurants and I knew how to talk with the restaurant people and. But didn't really know how to talk. I mean, I worked with distributors as a, as a buyer, but never worked with them on ride-alongs or you know. That, so it was a kind of a learning curve 
for me. So they kind of gave me, you know, the opportunity to kind of learn that side of the industry uh, while while they were learning it, and we kind of all kind of grew together, uh, which is kind of a kind of a cool, cool yeah. little little process. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. It's 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 funny because I mean, your story is similar to mine. I uh, that's how I started. I was you know manage manage bars, quote unquote. You know, I was essentially just like the spirit buyer for a few places yeah. in uh, Hillsburg, and so. It all started when I started, the reps started bringing in things that were like, this is a vodka that's made, you know, just at one town over. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, really? exactly. Yeah. Really? That's, uh, okay, I got to have this. Right. So, yeah, sign me up, you know, and it just started... It's, it started, it's like Pokemon. I mean, that's a terrible analogy, but it's like I wanted to collect all these craft spirits and yeah. just like see how 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 uh, how they vary and then like what's happening and what makes, you know, Maker's Mark so special, you know? And it's like, okay, you know, but it's, it's uh, and it, the cream's starting to float to the top and, uh, you know, these, these big companies are going to start being in trouble here pretty soon, I think, you know, with all these craft brands coming up. And there's now, um, I remember a few years ago, there was, there wasn't a distillery and like, there's only like a craft distillery in like 40 of the 50 states now there's like three craft distilleries in every state yeah something like that it's yeah. it's crazy and it's just going to keep growing yeah and uh we have 14 here in georgia which is yeah crazy because i mean up until a few until september like it really was it was very restrictive on what you right. could do and like as far as your like tasting room and that kind of yeah that kind of stuff um you know it wasn't a very friendly environment to, mm-hmm. for us to 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 work and, and right. to make money, uh, but now they've opened up that law, and you know we can you can come into our tasting room. We could sell you a bottle. Uh, yep. You can have a cocktail. Um, you know, so there's this this is a great huge new revenue stream uh, mm-hmm. for us. I mean, we hired somebody else to uh, to come in and work the tasting room for us because yep. of because of that. So I mean, it's it's creating jobs around the state, and yep. uh, which is which is awesome. Yeah, we couldn't even give tours when we were starting out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's come a long way. It, as far behind as we are. Yeah. Here in Georgia, Georgia was the last state to allow breweries and distilleries to do direct sales. And so we, we've come a long way in a short period of time. We needed to, but, but we did. So. No, that's uh, um, Okay. I just want to make sure I still have your mic on. Did you talk for me again? Sure. Did Casey break it? No, <laughs> he breaks stuff. He Told breaks, you I broke. I, I broke it. the boiler earlier. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, no, we're at, we're at good levels. Okay, I don't know go. how because he wasn't even here, <laughs> but I'm still pretty sure it's his fault. I turned it turned on for me. Yeah, well, <laughs> you turn things on better than I do. Okay, perfect. Um, no, yeah, I, I don't want to lose train train of thought. I mean, it's just a. Uh, to me, like I said, it's, it's the craft movement is kind of a, a window into the future. It's just of how things are starting to progress and move, and yeah. uh, you know, um, it's gonna be uh, just not just with craft. It's uh, with with everything, anything. You know, uh, small guys like I mean, Elon Musk isn't small, but at the same time, it's like here he's coming in. You know, starting starting something new with Tesla. Yeah, like, yep. he's changing. He's you know, stuff stuff's happening. Things are changing. Yeah. Um, well, okay, I uh, gotta try this rye. Yeah, yeah we'll um, do that. definitely. Um, but uh, that's yeah, that's, that's. So yeah, explain this guy a little bit. This is okay, small batch. Clearly, so, you know, you do have him in the three seventy fives. I see. Yeah, just because again, we had one barrel. Uh, we aged it a hundred proof, so real low okay. proof on this. Um, so that was to get it to really. To go from out of the barrel into the bottle with a pretty minimal amount of dilution, um, but that of course also impacts your yield. So we right. And this is a series that we only do uh, out of the distillery. It's called our Outlier series. Okay. Um, and we we did we do this for stuff that we want to experiment with. Yeah, so uh, we only got two hundred and forty-four bottles. Seven. Three seven 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 five. Five. How many? Two hundred forty-four. Yeah. So talk about we had a thirty-gallon barrel. It was, we were aging in, and uh, it was there for 17 months. 
you know, there, you get a little bit of Angel share, and then there's also Michael and Casey share right. as well, which, which <laughs> has a big like impact. This. You wouldn't believe how that impact. It gets sampled pretty regularly. Right. People are like, do you sample regularly? And I'm like, well, you know, with like stuff like the, the bourbon, we've kind of gotten it's part of the job. You know, to where we kind of let the bourbon go until we think it's getting close and we start checking it. But with something like this, you know, we, it was well monitored. I think you could probably yeah. say. Yeah, we've done with this, uh, you know, like I said, it's only available here, but we've done all kinds of cool experimental things uh, with this one we did. The first one we did was a, a single malt uh, that was, uh, we had Blue Tarp, which is a brewery that's right next to us. They did a, uh, a Scotch Ale uh, mash for us, but no hops or anything like that. And then we fermented it and distilled it over here uh, and aged that. And then we did, uh, we did the wheat whiskey uh, that we were talking about. Uh, we did a, a 2.0 or the uh, outlier number two was just the wheat whiskey at uh, six, 18 months? Uh, yeah, that was at a 15 gallon barrel. 15 gallon barrel for 18 months. And then we did a 2.1, uh, which was the same distillate that we let go in a 30 gallon barrel for two years. So that was actually the first straight wheat whiskey produced uh, in Georgia uh, at that time. And then, and then the- uh, Beer schnapps. And then we did the beer schnapps. Uh, so a Very local cool. brewery, uh, Three Taverns, which is just right over here, they do a yeah, Christmas Joe ale. Cool. Yeah, uh, and they did it called uh, Feast Noel. Um, and they had, in February, they had about 300 gallons left over. And uh, they, you, can't, you don't sell a lot of uh, Christmas beer in February. So uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And the brewer over there, uh, a guy named Jorn, said, make beer schnapps. And they, so they called us and said, hey, we got this, all this beer. Do you guys want to distill it? And they were like, Hell sure, yeah. Sure, why not? <laughs> and we right. had no idea how it was going to turn out because we yeah. never done anything like that as far as we had known. Oh, so, I mean, it's a heavily spiced beer. Yeah. So, I mean, right. the base is like a Belgian quad. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I'm like, okay, if you distill a Belgian quad, you're going to get a beautiful whiskey. But they add cardamom, allspice, and cloves. Well, like, yeah. I mean, some pretty serious uh, spices. Uh, and then they lightly hop it as well. But then they also, the reason we had to call it beer schnapps is because they add Belgian candied sugar um, as part of the brewing process. And so once you add that, TTB says you can't call it whiskey right. anymore, so uh, we called it beer schnapps. Beer schnapps, okay. Um, so you got that nice malt base, uh, and then you got uh, all that spice came over as well. Um, and we aged it in 15 gallon barrels for 20 months or 22 months, just under two years. It was 22, yeah. And uh, so it picked up that oak. It took it that long just to get kind right. of a balance between the spices and the barrels. I mean, those spices just dominated for so long yeah. until finally they kind of uh, came into check. Um, and that was when we bottled it and it was fantastic. We sold out of that in, in no time. Yeah, it was kind of like a, a, like a really dry Amaro mm -hmm. or a, kind of like a, a slightly sweet gin. That's kind, of, kind of what it was like. It was really interesting. It was one of, that was a really cool uh, project. Well, I'm. I'm loving this. This is great. Like um, yeah. I want to, so you aged it at a hundred proof, mm -hmm. which is just pretty, you know, you say it's low, I guess. What is, what is standard then? With rye whiskey, uh, and I'm no expert, but from what I've read and what I understand, rye whiskey, for whatever reason, uh, the larger producers who, again, with bourbon, kind of 125 is the standard. 125. Um, you know, you see variations on that. With rye whiskey, it does seem like those guys are aging at lower proofs, uh, usually closer to like 114. Right. Um, you know, I've seen some, some kind of random numbers. I, I've never been able to find out why they do that. Uh, I have a feeling it's one of those, that's just how it was done. And right. you know, because a lot of those guys, that's how they operate. It's, that's how we always did it. Yeah. That's us. But it is interesting that just based on what I've seen that Rye whiskey is generally aged at a lower proof. Again, not right. 100 proof is an extreme as far as low proof, but um, it seems that even the big guys are doing that too. So, right. well, that's I mean, my, just after first tasting this, it is uh, it comes off. I don't want to say thin, but it's really it's really light, bright, fruity, almost mm -hmm. sweet and. Uh, and it, it's like, in, what is it? What is it sitting at now? What is it? What is it? Ninety, proof. 90, 90 proof. proof. Okay, yeah. so I guess, I don't know. There's something about it that's awesome. Like that's, it's something. It's almost like it could be the aging because it is like it just absorbed more, 
more uh, flavors from the barrel, but not like the char. I don't know. My guess um, is, so we were really amazed at the fruitiness mm -hmm. that this came off with. Uh, I'm thinking when I was first, it was my first time working with rye, and I knew that rye ferments in just a whole other way um, right. than corn or molasses, and so these ferments took off. Right. And I had a hell of a time keeping the temp under control on them. I, mean, I was running the chiller on them, and, but they still fermented pretty hot. And, you know, when you ferment hot, you stress your yeast. When you stretch your yeast, sometimes you can create really off flavors. Sometimes uh, you can create these really nice estery, you know, floral kind of notes. And I think that's what happened. Um, you know, I, I've seen brew, both brewers and distillers where they intentionally stress their yeast in different ways yeah. to get those yeast to produce these different flavors. Um, so I, I think it might be a happy accident, essentially, yeah, right? Uh, which those are usually the best ones. Um, but it really did. I mean, I mean, you, you obviously picked up on it and yeah. we did definitely that it's got a really floral character to it. Yeah. It's yeah. got that rye spice, but that's not the predominant smell and taste. And again, that, that wheat, uh, you know, one third malted wheat really kind of reigns it in, you know, wheat's just. I always explain it to people like this, think of bread, you know, you got cornbread, wheat bread, rye bread, you know, wheat bread's kind of your, it's everybody's friend, right? You can use wheat bread, you're not going to offend anybody, you know, you can make a great sandwich with wheat bread, you know. Okay. Rye is going to have more flavor, more character, you know, cornbread is just big, full of flavor. And when you're distilling like we do, you know, where we're leaving all that character in there, I mean, we, all these are double distilled, so, I mean, all that grain flavor comes through and that's what you get. I mean, that the wheat for the first uh, about 12 months or so in the barrel basically smelled and tasted like alcoholic bread, more or less. Yeah. Um, it really took it a bit before it really started to pick up that barrel character, uh, much more so than the, than the bourbon, um, interestingly enough, even though it's a much uh, softer spirit going into the barrel. Uh, it just took it a while uh, to really pick that up. Very cool. Well, like I said, this stuff is... Uh this is some of the best whiskey I've had in a while. I really, I really enjoy it. I really do. Um, cool. All right. So I guess last question, and then then we could wrap this up. So how do you guys see your progression and expansion? You know, um, one thing it's like it's always fun to ask distillers because it's like, well, I mean, do you build a brand to eventually sell it, or do you do you build it? build the brand to just grow it on your own or would you build it to sell it and then just go back to distilling under a different label you know um that's the thing uh I've, I've, yeah right? <laughs> yeah I, I mean <laughs> it depends on how things work out i mean you know obviously this is this is driven by you know a passion yeah and wanting to do things a certain way that being said i, I don't want to be broke the rest of my life i mean you know right i've had enough of being broke yeah um I'm not saying I'm ready to sell out. Right. Unless you're offering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm willing to. Unless there's anybody uh, out there that has some money. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I'm a purist, but at the same time, you know, I'm also a realist. Uh, right. You know, ideal situation. Um, I, I love the example of like um, uh, St. George, you know, uh, out in California. You know, yeah. they, they built up that vodka brand, the Hangar One. Yep. By doing something, you know, basic but really cool which was just let's use high quality fruit and make really high quality fruit versus fruit flavored vodka right sold it for a ton of money and you know if you see interviews with him he's like hey you know that's what paid the bills yeah. and that's what allows me to do all the things that i love absolutely so you know you pour yourself out a little on the side and it allows you to do the things you love the way you want how you want right um but you know you it, you know it, it it is a business and mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's gotta be a viable business or you better have a lot of money. Right. Um, otherwise, you know, you're not gonna be around long, you know? Um, so I don't know if that really answered your question. No, 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 I no. Mean, no it's, it, you know, it's where fine. it is right it's now great. is, no, uh, it's, uh, I mean, we're still so early get, on. I mean, we're here, we're technically, we're, we're city of Decatur, but Decatur is essentially has been enveloped by Atlanta. I mean, if, if, if we're penetrating even a small amount of the metro area, you know, we're talking 6 million people, um, we're having trouble keeping up with right. the band, which yeah. I, welcome, I welcome that uh, if and when it happens. Uh, so as far as like, you know, world domination, no, yeah. we're not there yet. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I think it makes sense. And you see what's happening with crap brewing right now is you see a lot of these guys that got big and they got big too fast. Green Flash uh, just had to pull yeah. the reins in, you know. Um, if you're going into new markets and you can't support it, you're, you're going to get burned and then you can't go back into them um, right. for quite some time. Or you just see where, you know, in a place like Georgia where the local brewers have been both low in number and there just hasn't been this consistent high quality beer right. uh, up until, you know, the last several years. And so now you can go into a store and whereas before you would have been looking for, you know, one of those big, big as far as craft go breweries for your go-to beer. Now, if you're interested in good local beer, it's there. Right. And a lot of people are going to choose who are that set of consumer are going to choose a local beer over national beer if it's equal or better. Yeah. And so the the guys who are, you know, have that national footprint are they're hurt. Yeah. Um, just because a lot of these smaller, you know, you know, Georgia's behind everybody just because of yeah where we are bible belt you know we're, we're working with all these ridiculous laws so we're just getting caught up with the rest of the country um so it's it'll be interesting to see what happens with spirits absolutely um, i could see something very similar happening where you have some of these guys that got in early and they produced at a level that they could distribute nationally and and they were able to do it uh, but as more and more local folks who are focused on just their market come in, I mean, that's going to be strong competition for them. I mean, right. Again, it's all about, you know, people want to support local. And if it's the quality's there and it's at least as good, if not better, then, you know, I believe that's what they're going to yeah. choose. No, exactly. It's, uh, so I think it's going to shift pretty significantly over yeah. the next couple of years, is what I you'll agree. see. I agree. Well, uh, fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. I, uh, I, I love what you do here. I love your products. They're great. Um, so I think, yeah, let's wrap this up. So cool. I, I know you got to get back to the still. Casey, I think you're going to make some cocktails here in a sec. Yeah. And then we'll we'll yeah, check yeah. that out. But uh, cool. Well, cheers, guys. Thanks. Cheers. And just for the record, Casey's goal is just to get paid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. Right. <laughs>